On today's program, former Oklahoma gardening host Ray Campbell joins us from his vegetable garden to let us in on his secrets for getting great tomatoes. David Hillock has pruning techniques for the various roses in our landscape. Ray also shows some of his new raised beds and talks about their construction, how to get them up and going for the gardening season, and how proper raised beds can assist gardeners who have mobility issues. Extension Youth Specialist Shelly Mitchell also has a fun project for the young gardeners. Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. You know, just recently I was out at a local garden center and nursery here in Stillwater and was talking to a friend of mine that owns that garden center. And it was, you know, it was in late March, mid to late March, I guess. And it was a really bright, warm, sunny day. And he told me that he had all kinds of people in, the, in there that day wanting tomato plants. Well, obviously that's way too early to plant tomatoes because of the dangers of frost and also the soil temperatures. But we do really get really kind of antsy, so to speak, when the weather gets warm and we start seeing spring really come to life. But one of the things we can do now is to go ahead and prepare our tomato planting site, which will really help us out when we plant the tomatoes later on when the temperatures of the soil and when the danger of frost is all passed. And so what I like to do is at least uh, two or maybe even better, three weeks before planting, I like to go in and prepare my planting site. And the way I do that is dig a hole where I'm going to plant my tomato at least eight inches deep, maybe even eight to 12 inches deep, and about a, a foot wide. Then I want to come back in and I want to refill that hole with two parts of compost and this is compost that's not been screened it's just rough compost but it's really good compost you don't have to use compost but some type of good organic matter maybe manure or or some sort of organic matter uh, will would, would suffice but i'll do two parts of that to one part of soil then in order to give the tomatoes a little bit of a start I like to put in about a third of a cup of lime. Now the reason I like to put the lime is, is because I want some added calcium in there to help prevent blossom end rot. And this particular lime is called rapid lime. It has soluble calcium in it. So I know it's going to go ahead and get into the soil solution when I start uh, the, uh, the process of, of mixing it in and getting it in into the soil. So I put about a third of a cup of lime, two tablespoons, of a good complete fertilizer such as 10 20 10 or 12 12 12 and then just mix that in really good and then we'll have about two or three weeks here for all that compost to start continuing to further decompose for the soil uh, to begin to take up some of the lime and the fertilizer that we've put in there and then i will have my hole all ready to plant my tomato when time comes and I won't have to do any type of preparation. In order to remember where this is, because I know it's going to rain and things are going to sort of settle down, I just stick a flag in there or a stick of some kind and mark exactly where my hole is. Then when it comes time to plant, I know where my planting site is. I can put my tomato in there, get it off to a good start. Then after I plant my tomato, what I like to do is get just a garbage bag, such as this, black garbage bag. I'll put it over that tomato hole. 
I do this about 10 days before I plant. Stick it down good with either rocks or boards or these landscape fabric pins. And the reason I'm doing that is because that's going to help warm that soil up. The sun will get onto the soil, will warm it up good, and then I can just simply jerk that off or even plant my tomato right through a hole that I put in this plastic. And then I've got my tomatoes off to a good start. So when you get really sort of in a hurry to plant your tomatoes, this time of the year, instead of planting them, go out and fix your tomato planting site. Then you'll feel like you've done something to help those tomatoes out. Now is a great time to take a look at your roses in the landscape and do a little pruning if you need to. Uh, usually we start uh, pruning in about mid-March mid in Oklahoma, depending on, but it will depend on where you live and the temperatures. And usually we want to start about the time that the buds are just starting to swell. On this shrub here, you can see the shoots have already kind of broken out, but it's still early and so we're going to go ahead and do a little pruning. Now it helps to know what types of roses you have. There are several different varieties and types out there and some are pruned uh, a little bit harder than others. Now the modern roses such as the hybrid teas, floribundus, grandiflores, and the miniatures, those are the ones that we typically prune pretty hard. And we're going to clean those up. Uh, we'll prune them back about half to even maybe two-thirds the, the size of the plant. And we're typically going to look for pruning them back to about three to five main canes and then pretty much clean out everything else. This will encourage good new growth, strong healthy growth that will produce lots of flowers because they bloom on the current season's wood. Um, other types would include things like the landscape roses, the shrub roses that we use, and typically we don't prune those as much. Uh, they usually just need a little bit of light pruning, um, maybe a little shaping, maybe a little thinning out. Uh, one of the purposes of pruning them so much is air movement. Uh, one of the problems we have with a lot of the roses are foliar diseases. And so we want to make sure that uh, there's good air circulation through the shrub uh, so that we can reduce the amount of disease that may occur on the plants. So we have a shrub here, then we're gonna, this one hasn't been pruned for a little while, so we're gonna really, really uh, cut this one back pretty hard. Um, so one of the things that you um, look at first are the dead, dying, and diseased types of branches, and we'll start by removing some of those. They have some down here inside the shrub, and uh, to, you know, now two types of pruners that I use on roses is or the hand pruners. I like the, the bypass type versus the anvil type. This uh, gives a nice clean cut where the anvil type has a tendency to crush the stem when you cut it. And then a good pair of loppers. Uh, these will of course work on, on some of the larger canes that we're going we're gonna to attack. So we'll start uh, by pruning out uh, some of these inner uh, branches that are dead. We've got some dead ones down in here. Oh, that one looks like it's been broken. Uh, we got a really big one down in here. A big old cane that's been there for a while. We'll get rid of it and clean these out. Now, of course, you know, as everybody knows, roses are quite thorny, so it's a good idea to wear some good, sturdy leather gloves. And if you can actually find some that go up your arm, that's even better to help avoid all the scratches that you'll get. And we're just going to start. Uh, removing some of the, opening this up a little bit by removing some of the inside branches. Typically when we cut, we're going to, uh, when we start making our final cuts here, we're going to prune back to an outside pointing bud. And so that uh, that new shoot will start growing out, out away from the center of the shrub versus inside. And that again helps open up the, the center of the shrub. As you can see, we've really taken a lot of material out of this shrub. I'm getting down to the last few cuts, a couple of more pointers. You don't want to leave any shoots that are smaller than a pencil size. Those are weak shoots and just kind of rob the plant of vigor. So we're going to go ahead and remove those. They won't produce very strong uh, flowers anyway. And then uh, another thing to remember too is a lot of our roses are grafted roses. So if you have shoots coming down well below the graft, um, that's another rose, and usually it's a wild rose, and you don't want those, so you'll want to remove any suckers that might be coming out. So we're going to finish cleaning up here. We're going to cut all these back again to 
looking for an outside bud as we remove these back. And again, if they're, really, if they're competing and they're too close together, remove those. Okay, so this is what you would do to uh, some of the modern roses. Again, the hybrid teas, floribundas, grandiflores, and the miniature roses. This is uh, the extreme printing that you'll give it, and they'll come back nice and provide some beautiful roses, beautiful flowers. Let's go take a look at one of the landscape roses that we prune just a little bit differently. Here's one of our landscape roses, and it's really not in too bad a shape. It's getting a little full and probably will want to do a little thinning out. Um, but in this case, uh, again, we're not going to do a lot of pruning. You can see in here we have some, some dead material, um, some possibly diseased and, and damaged material. Anything that's got these black and reddish uh, marks on the stems probably ought to come out. Uh, we also have, um, kind of interesting, there's a, uh, a shoot, a couple shoots coming out from below here. They're shooting back into the center of the, of the, br of the shrub and we'll remove those as well. So. Um, if you notice on this plant too that it has the rose hips on it and a lot of times uh, people will remove the old spent blossoms to encourage uh, the plants to bloom more and to keep it nice neat and tidy but in this case the rose hips are actually very attractive they last well into the winter months and uh, uh, the birds love them and they can be a good source of vitamin C too if you're interested in that so we'll go ahead and remove uh, just to clean this up just a little bit uh, we're going to start by removing this big shoot down here that's uh, shooting in towards the center of the shrub. Now that we have that removed, we're going to just go ahead, go ahead and start cleaning up the dead and, and the diseased stuff and clean this up. And other than that, we probably won't do much to this shrub. So there you have it. We have a shrub that's been cleaned up, got rid of the dead stuff, thinned it out a little bit. It looks a lot cleaner, a lot nicer, and it's ready for a new growing season. You know, shortly after I retired uh, in the Department of Horticulture and Landscape Architecture at Oklahoma State University, I became very interested in one part of horticulture referred to as horticulture therapy. Actually, I had studied a little bit about horticultural therapy earlier in my career, but as I knew as I was getting a little bit older and some of my physical uh, capabilities were becoming limited, I knew that at some point in time, I may have to employ some of the horticulture therapy techniques for myself. So I actually, I enrolled in the horticulture therapy course at Oklahoma State University, Oklahoma City, under Julia Laughlin, one of my former students, which was very interesting. And we learned a lot about the, the things that, that we can do to continue to increase and allow people to continue to garden and enjoy the aspects of horticulture even though they have physical limitations. And as I'm beginning to age and have had some problems with knees and with hips uh, and bones like many of us do, I found out that getting up and down, up and down from the garden has been a very difficult thing to do. And so I decided this year because my raised beds were already beginning to, to, to go down and break down and need to be renovated, that I would build some raised beds that were elevated more so that I could actually sit on the side and garden that way and it's been very very effective for me. So what we started with was simply a, a, a four by four very similar to this it was a treated four by four that was sunk about nine inches into the ground and then we positioned on the on that four by four one by twelve actually one by eights but when they're playing down they're only about one by seven two of those high to give us a little bit of height. Now what Marty did when he built these, he actually put the sides together in his shop so that he had the, the, uh, the sides, the two one by eights uh, uh, screwed in or fastened on to the leg. He had a seat, a similar seat put on the side here so I could sit on it and braced underneath. And we simply came in, dug the hole, put the two sides down, leveled them good, and then he uh, used some screws and screwed in the ends to the to the uh, to the two legs on each on each side, and it made a very very good bed for us to actually uh, go ahead and fill up with soil. Now I've got quite a bit of depth in here, and um, you know topsoil can kind of be expensive if you get really good topsoil. So I decided what I would do is I would use some cheaper topsoil on the bottom, and so I've got it filled up to about. Uh, 
to about oh maybe half or a little bit more than half with a rather inexpensive topsoil that is uh, got some good drainage to it some some sand loam but I wanted some better soil on the top so I, I was able to get from Prairie's Edge Landscape here in Stillwater I was able to get screened compost which you know I thought you can't beat that so I went ahead and filled the top up with screened compost and you can see here the difference in the soil here where the uh, the, le the less expensive topsoil uh, sandy loam is on the bottom and then the good screen topsoil is on the top like here and so when, when we when we got that fixed and I went ahead and just fill this on in with my screen topsoil or my screen compost I really had an excellent bed here to grow things in without too many more soil amendments and so I'm really anxious this year to see how this is going to come out uh, and perform for me and I've already begun to plant in this uh, these raised beds and I, they've they worked out great for me I really like them because of the height uh, after we had put the two sides on of the one by eights we had secured the seat on the side and then it filled in around the edges of it I have a height here of about 14 inches which is just about perfect for me to be able to sit down and get up without a lot of uh, a lot of problems and I the, the beds are four feet wide so I can reach from one side to the middle of the bed and then I can walk over on the other side and reach into the middle from the other side and you know we can grow just about anything in a raised bed we can grow in a ground bed uh, one of the things we have to consider is because they are raised they're, they're going to dry out much quicker so more attention has to be paid to watering and to irrigation and I'll probably come in later and put in some sort of a drip or a, a irrigation system on these that will help me to maintain a better a more even water supply but like I say you know you can grow about anything in these raised beds over here in this raised bed and this one is four by eight feet so that's about what 32 feet <clears throat> I have dedicated it to strawberries now someone said you know that's tying up a bed for for an entire year and in fact for several years with just strawberries why are you doing that well I'm doing that for two reasons maybe three I've got plenty of raised beds to grow what I want to grow, plus still some ground beds. And I like strawberries. I mean, that's the simple thing. You grow what you like, you grow what you want. And with strawberries, there's not many other fruits or many other vegetables for that matter any closer to the ground that you have to bend over or get on your knees and pick than strawberries. Maybe potatoes since they're under the ground. But you know, strawberries are really what we used to call a stoop crop. They definitely are and so that's why I dedicated this bed just to strawberries this year because they're new I can come in and interplant in the center I'll probably come in a little bit later this spring and and I may plant uh, you know I, I could go ahead and plant some early spring vegetables in here even now I may could even plant some later things in fact I'm even thinking about uh, maybe planting a couple of squash plants in here they'll give a little bit of shade to the strawberries as they grow so you know, you can grow about anything in these raised beds. I'm really proud of, of the ones that I've got. And then over here on the other side, I've got a different type of raised bed and we're gonna do some planting in it. It was less expensive than these simply because it was made out of less expensive material, but still just as, as functional. And it's made simply out of landscape uh, timbers. This particular raised bed was already existing like my others were, but, and they were all made from landscape timber except the others with the landscape timber had already began to deteriorate, but this was still in really good shape. And so I really didn't want to destroy it. So all I did was build up on the existing bed that I had, which of course was much too low for me. And I built this on up with a couple of more landscape timbers and made a very functional bed. Once again, where I can just simply sit here on the edge of the bed and do my planting from, from the side. I've already planted my broccoli and cabbage, uh, green cabbage up to this point, but I also wanted some, some red cabbage. And so that's simply what I'll do right now. I'll go ahead and I'm putting my cabbage actually about 12 inches apart, which is a little bit uh, close spacing for, for cabbage if you want big heads, but I want smaller heads. And if you bring those together in a smaller spacing, you're going to have a, a little bit a smaller head simply because of the competition. So we can go ahead and I'll finish planting these out. Um, 
when I get through on this side, I'll just walk over to the other side and plant from that row as well because you see I can easily reach to the center and then I can walk over and reach to the other side if I wish to do that. But all I have to do is just kind of scoot up the bed like this without ever having to get up or get down. And so it's working out very, very well for me. Another thing, as I mentioned in our, some of our other earlier beds that we talked about, is that we can do some intercropping or some interspacing on these. And so that's what I've done here. I've just planted my cabbage, then I've gone ahead and inter, interspaced or interplanted with onions. And it's, it's working out very well because about the time that I want to add nitrogen to these cabbage uh, to kind of promote their growth, then I would probably be about the same time I'd also want to add nitrogen to my onions to promote bulb growth on those as well. And so, it, again, it's worked out very, very well for me. I really am enjoying my raised beds. And if you're having some trouble, uh, some sort of limitations physically in, uh, in the garden, I would encourage you to look around and check out on the website, check out horticulture therapy, check out uh, gardening for, for disabled people. There's many, many websites that you can go on out there and find some tips, some helps, and some aids for gardening for those people who have some sort of limited uh, capabilities or physical uh, limitations. So I would really encourage you to do that. And uh, I'm kind of excited about the way mine's gonna turn out this year. As you can see on this particular raised bed, I've already put my, I've put my hoops over it uh, because it's very easy then after I've got my hoops installed there to maybe put a row cover over that should I have some sort of a tender crop in here or something that I wanna protect either from a, a late frost, an early frost in the, in the fall, or even maybe from the, the extreme heat in the summertime. Uh, what I have done before, I've used my hoops like this in the, in the garden as well to prevent some insect damage. And that's probably what I'll do with these. I'll probably cover these cabbage and broccoli and, uh, over with uh, a light shade cloth or a light cloth later on, actually just to help reduce the, the damage from uh, the, uh, the cabbage moth or the cabbage looper. So, you know, it's been very functional for me and, and uh, I would encourage you, as I said, to, to look and see and Try to do some different things in your garden. I mean, you know, we need to renovate our garden occasionally. If we're gonna renovate our garden, let's renovate it to where it can be the most functional for us. I'm Shelly Mitchell, the state coordinator for Junior Master Gardener Program. And one of the things I like to do with kids is show them how seeds germinate. Now normally when people show kids how seeds germinate, they just put them in some potting soil, maybe in a Dixie cup, and the kids wait for days and don't see anything. It's because the first thing that germinates are the roots. So I like to show the kids how the roots germinate by giving them their own little germination station. So we get these little jewelry bags. You can get a hundred of them for like a dollar. And all we do is we take a hole punch and punch a hole in the middle and what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a necklace and the kids can germinate their own little seed in their own little necklace. So for a source of water, we put in a cotton ball and get it wet. That's just so the seeds have something to drink. And the cheapest source of seeds, especially for large groups of kids, is just a bag of beans. Because beans are seeds after all. And if you get the 15 bean soup mix, you got a whole bunch to choose from. All right. So the kids can pick one kind, they can pick two kinds, they can germinate, you know, several in one bag, and they can even have races. So I'm just going to pick a couple here. Just drop them in like that, and they'll get enough water from that cotton ball. Now, one thing you can ask kids is, do you think the seeds need sunlight or warmth to germinate? And so some kids will pick sun, some kids will pick warmth. And so what you do is you have all the kids wear their necklace, and if they think that the sun makes it germinate faster, then they'll wear it outside their shirt. If they think the warmth will make it germinate faster, they just wear it inside their shirt. And then after a couple of days, you can see whose is germinating faster. And after a couple of days, you can see the roots. 
and that's going to germinate before the shoots. So the kids will sit there and look at their look at the uh, roots. They could just sit there at their desk and look at it so it doesn't disrupt anything if you have a class. And it's really interesting to watch and the kids really like it. And if you want to, once they sprout, you can actually transplant them into a pot and then transplant them into your garden and eat the beans. Next week, former host Steve Owens joins us to talk about succulents, including types, growing tips, and propagation. Floriculture professor Bruce Dunn has scarification and stratification tips for better seed germination. David Hillock visits with Myriad Gardens Director of Horticulture, Casey Sharber, about Southwest injury in trees. Barbara Brown prepares a winter vegetable soup. And we have garden tips for April. So join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.